Well, as you can tell from the, the title here, I'm going to cover the more applied side of material science and engineering. Hopefully, I can hold your interest with that. I also wanted to mention that ExxonMobil is a big company. There's upstream, there's downstream, and I really represent the upstream side. Um, there is broader uh, needs in, of materials engineering in the upstream side, and so I'll be talking specifically about that. It's not that we don't use materials, materials engineering in the downstream side. We do. It's just a little more dynamic in the upstream side. Um, oh, also I'll mention, I don't, I don't think it was mentioned my academic pedigree. I'm from Ohio State University. My background's in material science and engineering. I have a PhD from that institution. Okay, so this will be the contents. I'll uh, provide some insights about the demand, the global demand and needs of, the, of energy out to 2040. I'll talk about why material science matters to ExxonMobil. I'll talk about the needs of the oil and gas industry with regards to advanced materials technology. I'll go, I'm going to spend the bulk of the talk on some project examples from ExxonMobil. I'll include in there one research example. And uh, structural steel, that's an oldie but a goodie. I'm going to have a world premiere. I left it last, so I have you on the edge of your seats until that time, and then I'll finish with a summary. The ExxonMobil Energy Outlook is an annual publication that uh, provides long-term global views of energy demand uh, and supply. It's uh, created by a team of scientists and engineers at ExxonMobil, and uh, the findings help guide our company's uh, planning and uh, investments. There's about 100 countries studied in that analysis, country by country, sector by sector. All uh, energy sources are considered. The scope is out to 2040, and the focus is to determine uh, what technologies will best meet, what technologies and fuels will best meet the needs of our future customers. Here are a few of the findings. Economic output is expected to double by 2040. There's going to be a very large expansion of the, the middle class. Energy demand will be up by 35%. The majority of the rise is in developing countries. And you can see over there in the inset, there's a graph that shows that developing countries like China and India are going to make up a large part of the demand. There's other countries as well. You can see them highlighted on the map. Electricity demand, due to this global rise in the middle class, is going to be quite substantial, providing the largest global influence of that energy demand. And there's another graph here that shows the, the fuels inputs uh, to electricity generation. The, on the y-axis is energy and time on the x-axis. And you can see that the predicted trends are increasing use of natural gas and nuclear, diminishing use of coal. And also, one thing you can notice is that solar and wind are relatively minor contributors there. And you, you might ask, well, why would that be? And if, if you look at the units, this was alluded to in the previous talk, if you look at the units of the y-axis, it's quadrillion BTUs. And what happens there is that solar and wind, while they're ever, they're, they're going to be very important in our future for sure, but when the economic and uh, when the global need is measured in terms of quadrillion BTUs, there are just certain realities with respect respect uh, to wind and solar. So not all of the factors of the energy outlook are, are covered here, but uh, in the, that is projected that the oil and gas industry will provide the majority of the energy demand out to 2040. Okay, so why does material science matter to ExxonMobil? It's because to find and produce and deliver large quantities of energy to the global market, it's necessary to innovate, to design, construct, and maintain very large infrastructure. <clears throat> and all of this infrastructure is made from materials. ExxonMobil uh, maintains world-class material science laboratories where we do research that spans, the work spans the entire technology chain, I'll call it. And that includes from the conceptual stage to the research testing and analysis stage. We do a lot of microstructural analysis, a lot of materials and mechanical testing. On the commercialization side, we get involved in a lot of fabrication technologies. And then in the end, this infrastructure that we produce to provide the world with energy has to be maintained. So certain technologies like inspection and maintenance technologies play a critical role as well. 
So here's a table that provides some of the design challenges in our industry. Because we're placing this infrastructure that I referred to out into the environment, some of the environment can be pretty harsh. There's winds and waves and currents and seismic activity that provide design loads to these structures, and they have to be dealt with on the design side. <clears throat> Corrosion and erosion will always be a part of what we have to deal with because of the byproducts of what comes out of the reservoirs underground, like hydrogen sulfide is an example. Low temperature, we're seeing an increased use in natural gas, and part of that is liquefied natural gas. And notice that the temperature of that fluid, when it's stored and when it's transported, minus 163 degrees centigrade. I'll show you an example about that and get into some more of the specifics. Wellhead pressures, we're starting to look at 20,000 PSI, and that brings the need of higher strength materials. Here's a few other considerations, material costs, fabrication costs, and maintenance. The oil and gas industry uses large quantities of advanced steels, nickel-based alloys, stainless steels. Material costs are always a concern. Fabrication costs, the primary fabrication technique by far is welding. And welding requires a lot of attention to detail in order to get it right and produce reliable infrastructure. Maintenance, inspection and repair technology play a big part in our maintenance uh, needs for the, and certainly for the future. So the overarching message here is for the oil and gas industry, we have a never ending need for materials that are more resilient, cheaper, and easier to use. And there's also a couple of allied technologies I'll refer to as fabrication and inspection. Those technologies are very important to the materials engineering world as well. So let's start with the wells. <clears throat> Materials and wells, drilling and completing these wells requires deploying materials down hole. This is an example of our Sakhalin Island development off of eastern Russia. You can see the inset picture there of the drill rig. The drill rig is onshore. It drills parallel horizontal wells up to eight miles out under the sea, reaches the oil and gas reservoirs there. And the types of materials that we put down hole, a lot of steel certainly goes down hole, but because of the higher temperatures and the more extreme uh, potentially corrosive conditions, there's a variety of chrome containing steels, stainless steels, nickel base alloys, even titanium that we put down hole. Elastomers provide some sealing technology. We put a lot of innovative downhole hardware to measure, monitor what's going on, and that's almost exclusively made from materials. So the needs here are lower cost materials, strength and toughness certainly plays a role, corrosion and environmental cracking resistance because of the harsh conditions downhole, and also wear resistance for drilling these extended horizontal wells. So here's an infrastructure example. This is the Kazamba development offshore Angola. It involves two large floating structures, several subsea drill centers, and many pipelines and risers. The risers are just vertical pipelines that connect activity on the ocean floor up to the facilities that are floating up above. And also on the, on the schematic there, you can see what looks like strings laying on the ocean floor. Those are all subsea pipelines. So the, the water depth here, a little bit challenging at 3,500 feet. We've certainly gone beyond that now. The price tag's $3.4 billion, and it has a 30-year design life. 20 and 30-year design lives are very common for installations like this in our industry. That's the only way you can justify going and doing something in these, these types of environments is to uh, look at a long design life and, and a lot of uh, production from a field like this. But and that means that the intent is, is that the infrastructure and the materials are going to go out into this environment and operate reliably for 20 or 30 years, and that puts a lot of demands on the materials. So here's a photograph of these two structures. You can see the pretty large 29,000, 84,000 tons, and the Super Bowl is right around the corner. So as a scientific unit of measure, I've got a football field, and there you have three football fields. So these are pretty large installations. There certainly is a lot of structural steel and steel pipe that goes into this type of development. There are other materials as well. Here you can see what we refer to at the drill centers as subsea architecture. It's a collection of pipes and pumps and valves, and that provides a, a, um, a control of the reservoir pressures and it moves fluids 
Uh, and in these, uh, d the uh, sub-sea architecture, because of the fluids that are just then coming out of the reservoir and reaching this location, we have to use more corrosive and erosive resistant materials, nickel-based alloys, and a lot of clad materials in that subsea architecture, quite uh, uh, common. And remember, these have to be on the ocean floor, unattended uh, for the life of the, the development. So they have to be very robust. Here's a very interesting product called a flexible riser. And some of these components, because they have to uh, accommodate and uh, uh, move with uh, the wind and waves up at the surface, they have to be flexible. So they're not actually solid pipelines. They're flexible risers. And they're combinations, they're layers of steel and polymers. The steel is in the form of wire windings. And it provides longitudinal strength, circumferential strength. And the polymers allow the flexibility. And they also provide some corrosion resistance as well. The needs, well, <clears throat> lower cost materials and fabrication and better corrosion resistance and environmental cracking resistance, particularly with respect to a lot of the subsea components, definitely need corrosion, better corrosion and environmental cracking resistance there. This is an example of what we refer to as the Berkut platform. It's offshore eastern Russia, close to Sakhalin Island. It's a gravity-based structure. 200,000 tons. This was a world record. The price tag was $12 billion, 30-year design life. And one unique aspect here was the, 40, the minus 40 degrees centigrade design temperature. Anytime you can see the picture on the, on the right hand side, you can see some winter ice flows. But anytime the design temperature is this low, it puts a lot of demands on the materials. The base unit there you can see in the fabrication yard, it's concrete. There's a lot of structural steel in these top sides, some of the one of the largest top sides that we've ever built, 42,000 tons. The structural steel that provides the superstructure underneath holding up all of that weight, when there's that much weight, the structural steel has to increase in thickness up to 100 millimeters, even 120 millimeters in some cases, four or five inches thick. And uh, there, that brings to a very important topic, and that is the welds that connect this platform together. Here's a photograph of a, a weld between two very thick sections of steel, well over 100 passes in this weld. And it turns out that the welds in these types of steel sometimes, depending on the specific steel, depending on the welding technique, it can develop degraded microstructures in the heat affected zone. The heat affected zone is the area in the base metal just adjacent to the weld. It's not molten during the welding process, but the microstructure, because of the high temperature welding, is altered significantly, and sometimes it is is degraded, potentially it's the weak link in the system. And so we have to consider brittle fracture as one of the possible failure mechanisms in this system. So brittle fracture involves some sort of stress concentrator like a crack tip. With applied loads, you get a lot of dislocation activity at that crack tip. It turns out that dislocations in some of the critical elements in this heat affected zone microstructure don't exactly get along. So some of the critical particles there, they can debond, they can crack, they can initiate cleavage fracture, and we have to have ways to mitigate that. One ways, a number of the ways that we mitigate will certainly with rigorous qualifications, both for the steel and the weld. Fracture mechanics testing of these materials plays a very critical role. <clears throat> weld procedure design, welding QA, QC, a lot of attention to detail on the welding because that is a, a manually controlled activity out in the fabrication yard. And so there's a lot of QA, QC attention to that, uh, that aspect. Inspection, of course, we inspect everything when we're done fabricating. If there's any um, defects that are too large to, uh, to threaten the, the viability of the structure, they would be repaired before it would go into service. The needs, lower cost materials and fabrication, low temperature toughness steel would sure be good in these applications. We have a never ending need for uh, better steels in this area. And of course, high strength steel. With higher strength steels, we could reduce the weight of the overall structure and that would provide some benefits. This is the Papua New Guinea development. It involves a drill site up in a mountainous region connected to 450 miles of pipeline to a liquefied natural gas plant and then export to market by ship. It has a $15 billion price tag, 30-year design life. And the unique aspect here is that some of the components in the facility, and there I'll label some, inside the gas storage 
tanks inside the pipe out to the ship and inside the ship itself, the fluid must be maintained at minus 163 degrees centigrade. That means structural steel is way too brittle for this application. We cannot allow steel to come in contact with this fluid and we have to use other materials and they happen to be more expensive. There you can see a little closer view of the, uh, the couple of LNG trains and the storage tanks in the background. So stainless steels, 9% nickel steel and NVAR. NVAR is an iron-based material with 36% nickel. I'll say a few more words about that in just a second, why it's important. But all of these materials play critical roles in this type of installation. Let me say a few words about the ship. This is an example LNG ship. It's not exactly the Papua New Guinea ship, but it's the same design so I can talk about the tanks that are inside the ship. Uh, and there's our unit of measure, almost four football fields, pretty big. Inside the tanks, are lined with a material called Envar. This is the 36% nickel alloy. You can see the silhouette of a human there down on the tank floor. And the, the Envar, let me go through some of the comparisons and contrast with other materials. So I have toughness at minus 163 degrees, coefficient of thermal expansion and cost versus steel in this table. You can see it's steel, not okay, not tough enough. So we have to afford to the tune of four times, six times, and 15 times these other materials. And in particular, Envar being 15 times the cost, the reason we use it is because of the coefficient of thermal expansion. It essentially has no coefficient of thermal expansion. I mean, it's one, it basically doesn't expand or contract with wide temperature swings. The deal here is that we can completely control the design stresses of of this tank because the material that we've chosen is not expanding or contracting with the heating and cooling that comes with fluid in and out of the, the tanks. So the needs, lower cost materials fabric and fabrication and lower temperature toughness steel. Again, that would be very useful. This is the research example that I'm going to talk about. I'll get a little more material science on this one. High strain pipeline welds. Now here the challenge is pipelines in areas of ground movement. That's where we have seismic activity, faults, landslides. And when that happens, the pipelines can be bent. They can be deformed, stretched by the ground movements. We have to have very resilient materials. It does allow, the designs allow for plastic deformation of the pipe. And the girth welds in the pipe then potentially become the weak link in the system. So the welds have to be very uh, uh, high strength and toughness. Toughness is the biggest challenge, and that's what I'm going to concentrate on now. The commercial technology was a bit limited in this area. We decided we needed to invent our own. So here's a, a cartoon of the concept that we used to solve this engineering problem. It involves a microstructure comprised of acicular ferrite, bainite and martensite. I realize there's not probably too many steel metallurgists in the, in the audience. You don't need to know what you, the part that you need to know is acicular ferrite is a very tough microstructure. Bainite and martensite is a very strong microstructure and we wanted to combine the two to get a really good combination of that. There's also non-metallic inclusions in this microstructure and in fact, the acicular ferrite nucleates on these non-metallic inclusions. That's a key part that I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about later. So we have a time and temperature plot here. This is called a continuous cooling transformation diagram. You can see the weld cooling curve marked there. It's a typical weld that we would use in this type of fabrication. And you can see that we have these phase fields, martensite, bainite, acicular ferrite, and the weld cooling curve is not intersecting the acicular ferrite region. And this diagram is meant to communicate what microstructures are possible to form in the weld. So the way we solve the problem, if you look at the acicular ferrite region there, is with PowerPoint animation. Now the acicular ferrite's in the weld. Let me do that one more time because for a steel metallurgist, this is really great stuff. So there's the acicular ferrite. That's how you solve the problem. Well, no, not really because this takes 10 minutes to do in PowerPoint and this takes three years to do in a research laboratory. So I'd like to explain how we tackled this challenge. 
Here's some of the microscopy work that we did. We did a lot of electron microscopy, many welding experiments. What we decided was it was the potency of these non-metallic inclusions providing a substrate on which the acicular ferrite will form. It was that potency that we wanted to engineer at a very fine detail. These inclusions are on the order of 300 to 500 nanometers. I got a couple of big ones here because they provide really nice pictures. But with some careful ion milling, we were able to look inside the inclusions. It turns out we had inclusions inside of inclusions. We decided that zirconium as a nucleating species, we looked at a lot of elements. I don't have time to get into those details. Zirconium at a very small microalloyed percentage, 0.02%, provided a nice nucleating surface for oxides. And then around the oxides, we got a spinel shell. And that spinel shell was a great nucleating surface for the acicular ferrite. We also looked at all of the key components of the welding process, the shielding gas composition, the welding wire composition, and the arc physics that were controlling the molten weld pool. The nonmetallic inclusions actually develop inside the molten weld pool. We had to control that very closely. So the welding, we moved on to full scale testing of the welds that we produced in the pipe. Here's a, a shot of the, the full scale testing apparatus. So this is essentially a large tensile test where the pipe is pressurized full pressure. It is a test of failure. Obviously, the person isn't going to be standing there. When we run the test, there's a big lid that comes over the testing machine. And the status is, and this is just a generic picture of a pipeline going into ground. I don't mean to say that this is the welds invented here. Um, going into the ground on that particular project. But we have some patents pending, and we have project welding trials with this technology underway as we speak. Okay, structural steel. All right, so now we're to the world premiere. Um, I mentioned the Outlook earlier, ExxonMobil Energy Outlook. I've got another Outlook here to unveil. Uh, I've got some ExxonMobil colleagues in the audience. Not even they have seen this. It's very exclusive. And the name of it is Doug Fairchild's Crystal Ball Oil and Gas Materials Engineering Outlook. And I realize the acronym is a little cumbersome. I'll work on that. But anyway, let's look at the few of the findings of this particular Outlook. A few findings, ExxonMobil spends about five to $10 billion per year on structural steel. It's by far the, the, you know, uh, the, the largest structural material that we're purchasing for our projects. And this is just ExxonMobil. If you go to the whole oil and gas industry, then you've got another order of magnitude to consider. Steel will be the workhorse material out to 2040. Carbon nanotubes will not be. No, no offense to carbon nanotubes, I love carbon nanotubes, but there's just certain scale and size requirements in the infrastructure that we deal with, and so there's certain realities. And steel is a structural material, particularly with the advances that have come within just the last 10 or 15 years, we have a lot of robustness in these structural materials and we can do great things with them. Steel metallurgy is more complicated than all of the other materials that I've mentioned in this talk. I've been looking in the electron microscope for about 35 years at all of these materials, and I stand by this statement. Way more complicated than the other uh, 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 materials that I've referred to here. And so there's some needs there. Steel metallurgy went out of vogue at American universities 25 years ago. So that's an interesting need. Where are we going to get the people for the future? And the oil and gas industry and other large industries as well that use this, this type of material, they have to ask themselves, where are they going to get the engineers to, to work these problems into the future? We need stronger, tougher, more corrosion resistant, weldable, lower cost structural steel. And we're going to have to look at the education and research in this area and develop strong relationships with key steel makers and universities. There still are a few universities around the globe that are concentrating in this area. OK, with that, let me move to a summary. I mentioned the ascendance of this global middle class driving future energy needs. And by the way, I don't know if you noticed in the, in the map that I showed there on the first uh, chart, but the United States, um, the, the developed countries flat to down. By 2040, the energy usage flat to down. We are doing very well with efficiency in the developed world, but it's really the, the developing world that's going to be driving a lot of the energy use demands in the future. The oil and gas industry will be a primary provider in the future. We have to design and operate all of these large uh, pieces of infrastructure. 
we have never ending need for these, what I refer to as more resilient, cheaper, and easier to use materials. Also, we need better fabrication and inspection technologies. Structural steel is going to remain the workhorse, and potentially there might be a future shortage in that area, and that's something that we have to keep an eye on. Okay, with that, I'll take some questions. Yes? Would you say a word about uh, the design of uh, offshore platforms? What are the critical issues in the design? Would reduce mass help? Would uh, is failure tends to be at the joints? Or do you worry more about earthquakes or wind or ocean? What, what are the critical mm. Well, first, maybe at a, a high-level cut, it depends. The question is, can I talk a little bit about the, the critical design challenges for offshore structures, offshore platforms? So the, 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 probably the first cut is to consider whether or not they are affixed to the ocean floor or whether or not they are floating. If they're affixed to the ocean floor, that technology actually is mature. It matured, frankly, in the 1980s. We know how to do that. But those water depths are around 1,000 to 1,500 feet, and we're way beyond that now. So most, most of the offshore installations now involve floating structures or a lot of subsea components. So the, but for the structures that are floating, um, and I, I mentioned a, a few there, yes, weight is definitely a factor and water depth is a big factor. What happens with water depth is when you have the structure up floating high and you have to attach all these risers that I mentioned and also mooring elements, mooring chains, et cetera. Um, well, they're a combination of rope and chains. But you have all of this stuff hanging off of the floating structure and it's weight. And if you have more weight, you need a bigger structure. And it's kind of like a, a never ending circle there. You know, the deeper, the more stuff, then you have to float it and you need a bigger floating structure. So certainly lighter weight materials and potentially higher strength steels, but, but also some innovations on the, the top sides and the floating structures to reduce the weight would be of interest. Um, the, I also mentioned the environmental harshness of what you have to do offshore. So the, just the, the, the salt water and then the product, the corrosivity of the product. <clears throat> we need resilient materials that can last out there 20 years, 30 years. So. Let me ask a quick question. So in, the, in these uh, composite polymer steel pipes that you use on the floating platform, yeah. is that polymers you use? specialized to that application, or are they related to others that we use in a more? Um, I don't, I'm not an expert on that. Those are um, products that I'm not intimately familiar with the engineering. It's my understanding, and maybe I'll look for another individual here that might have more information on that. But I don't think the polymers there are anything particularly special, but um, I don't know. Do you have any other comments? It's, Yeah, nylons, polyethylene, commercially available. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with your uh, also structures is 110%, but uh, being in academia, one of the issues is that federal funding is really low because, uh, like NSF or DOD, it's very difficult to get funding on steel. Uh, you have to find people to get funding. Uh, and also, when you go to the steel industry, Yeah, so the question is, and I understand, believe me, I came through the university system. Actually, I thought I was going to be a college professor when I got out of graduate school, but anyway, that, that didn't uh, pan out. But I saw the activity all the while I was working on my PhD. I was the only person in my group at the university working on steel. And so I, I could see what was happening with the funding sources, et cetera. The oil and gas industry in particular is going to have to think really hard about what they want to do 
to foster developments in the area and also to foster um, candidates, particularly candidates that are research capable, PhD candidates. If they want it in the future, the oil and gas industry is going to have to think real hard about funding that type of work. So that's just my own personal view. But you know, it doesn't come for free, and it's not likely to come from NSF. Or, or any government resources in the United States, exactly because of what you highlighted there is that the American steel industry, you know, I'm not, I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd go as far as say they're on life support, but they don't make the more advanced products that we need for the really challenging applications in our industry. They make some very good products, workhorse products for sure, but not the most advanced products. So we have to go look elsewhere for that. I missed the last part of that. So you're talking about high strength steel, and actually that was subarctic environment, but yes. Yeah. Right. The, the, are you talking about the ductile to brittle transition temperature and that challenge? Yes, yeah, that, 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 that particular subject I've worked on my entire career. That was a fundamental part of my, my PhD studies. That has been handled by this, at least this, on the steel industry side, that has been handled by thermomechanical control processing. It's a, a type of steel manufacturing where they, they, they go to low carbon contents and microalloy, and then they roll and roll and roll the steel. And they also use certain types of cooling to cool the steel at certain times to get the phase transformation right. And basically what they're working on there is the grain size. The grain size in the structural steels that we use is a fraction these days what it was 20 years ago. And it's that grain size that has reduced the ductile to brittle transition temperature, and that's how we can use the steels in that environment. Yes, yes, it's much more ductile. It's actually, it's also more weldable because they don't get the strength from carbon, which is how you get, you know, it's what you do if you want, uh, well, it's a lot of times what you do if you want a martensitic structure. But the carbon is basically out of the picture, and they're using processing to reduce the grain size, and the ductility and toughness comes from the grain size. Yeah. 